Uh, yes, sure. Uh, okay, so uh, today it's our great pleasure uh, to have Lady Maturno from Dark Mouse College. Uh, and uh, um, he is my friend. I know him for a while already. <laughs> and uh, he's a specialist in uh, uh, Legendrian submanifolds and uh, its relation to mathematical physics. Uh, so today he will tell us about cosmic censorship and smooth structures, Legendrian linking and black holes. Thank you very much for the introduction. As I told already to Hong Kwan, uh, I was really hoping to give this uh, talk in person in Prague. I uh, had the tickets, but then something happened and I was not able to come. But uh, I've been to Prague many times. Uh, because my wife was a graduate student at Charles University and I hope to uh, go to Prague again many times in the future and collaborate with Raman. Uh, and it's really a very pleasant city to visit. Uh, so the title of the talk is Cosmic Censorship in Smooth Structures, Legendre and Lincoln and Black Holes. So I guess we should start uh, chronologically. So the first word is cosmic censorship, and this requires a little introduction. So I have to say what is the Lorentz manifold. <coughs> so of course this is a manifold, but the metric is opposed to being a Riemann metric is Lorentz which means the following that if you diagonalize the form in each particular tangent space, then what you will get is dx1 squared plus dx2 squared plus 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 dxm squared. Then you put a minus sign and then you write minus dt squared, right? So the difference between the Riemann metric and the Lorentz metric is that for the Lorentz metric, there is this minus sign. So how is this related to physics? Well, the difference between Lorentz uh, metric and Riemann metric is that now for Lorentz uh, manifolds, you have vectors whose dot product with themselves is negative. Right? For example, the vector one a bunch of zeros and then say two in the last position is such. Such vectors are called time-like. And they represent movement, the speed less than the speed of light. So then there are vectors whose dot product of themselves is zero. So such vectors would, the, the example would be, for, for example, one, zero, zero, many zeros, one in the last position, they're called null or light-like. And they represent movement at the speed of light. And then there are vectors whose dot product with themselves is positive. So V dot V is greater than zero. They are called space-like. And they represent movement faster than light. <coughs> So they're not physically possible. Because Einstein teaches us that the fastest substance in the world is light. So if you move faster than light, then you cannot move at all. So what can you do? 
you can ask a very reasonable question. What is the shape of all vectors uh, whose dot product with themselves is zero? And then, of course, is predictable. This is the so-called null cone, which is the same light cone. Because it satisfies the equation x1 squared plus x2 squared. Plus Sorry, um, I have a strange question. Yes. Uh, is this uh, uh, mo movement uh, speed uh, is ca considered way in the space in the space or in space time? This is the space time. The Lorentz manifold is the space time. Yes, but uh, uh, speed. If something in this in this space, just in the space, it uh, doesn't move, but it moves in the time. So, if if a point doesn't move uh, in the space, yes. It moves in the time or not? The, the velocity it will does, be zero. It does because, no, I mean that if you look from the viewpoint of Newtonian mechanics and you freeze the space position, um, then of course the point is going in space time. Uh, but uh, in relativity, there is no preferred space and there is no preferred time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So, from. Sure. Uh, so this, of course, is the equation of the cone. And if you ask yourself, how do the space-like vectors look like? The space-like vectors point outside of the cone. The null vectors are on the surface of the cone. And uh, time-like vectors point inside of the cone. So there is a natural question: What is time? What is future? And the answer is a little bit strange. The future is just a choice of one half of the cone. That's it, right? Because a Lorentz manifold really looks as follows: that you have a manifold. And at each point in the tangent space, uh, you have a cone. So these cones are not on the manifold, they're in the tangent space. And they rotate somehow slightly uh, about the manifold because they don't have to be parallel to each other. And future is just choice of a half cone, a continuous choice with respect to the base point. So future is a continuous choice of the half cone. <coughs> you know, sometimes we tell our students that if they study hard, there is bright future which awaits them. Of course, probably if they would have known that bright future is just half of the cone, they would not study at all. But we hide this secret. So they continue to study and the life continues. So what is time travel? Well, in some sense, time travel is impossible because usually when people think about time travel, they think that you're moving faster than light. But it is not really too true that uh, time travel is impossible because what you can do is that you can look at the following Lorentz manifold, for example, a torus, and the cones are uh, going along the longitude. Then what would be a time machine? A time machine would be just a trajectory that points everywhere inside of the cones. So this is a perfectly legitimate time travel machine. Uh, but the problem, of course, is the following, that as we all know from science fiction, 
as soon as you build yourself a time travel machine, you're supposed to play um, jokes on your great grandfather and try to go into the past and prohibit your great grandfather from meeting your great grandmother. If you succeed, then you, they will never meet and you would not exist. So you would not be able to prevent them from meeting. If you don't succeed, there is a natural question. How did you uh, manage? What was the reason why you did not succeed? And by the way, if you have any questions, please interrupt me at any moment. We are not in a hurry yet. I'm quite flexible about questions. This leads to paradoxes. So the first condition that I would like to impose is the condition that no time travel is allowed. So th this can be formulated as the phrase that uh, there are no closed causal curves. So a curve is causal if it represents movement at the speed less or equal than the speed of light. So this red curve here is an example of a causal curve. It is closed. So this is exactly what I'm trying to prohibit. So I'm prohibiting time travel. And the second condition is a little bit more mysterious, which is no naked singularities. So we should, of course, raise the question, what is a naked singularity? And uh, it may be best if I explain it on the level of picture. So assume that I look at the Minkowski space time, the simplest possible situation. So the metric is two dimensional dx squared minus dt squared. <clears throat> so the light cones are just uh, these sectors going up. This is the light cone. So assume that I have an emitter, which stands here, it is something that emits some sort of a signal. And at this position, I have a receiver. And uh, my particle that I emitted from the emitter point moves. So it cannot move faster than light. So what you get is that at each uh, time moment, I can connect every point of this green curve with the receiver by a causal curve. So it means that if I'm a small human being sitting at the receiver point, I always have some sort of information about the traveling particle. Great. But now assume that I modify uh, my uh, space time and they delete the point one one. So I take scissors and they delete one point. So what will happen? So then this point is deleted and uh, I have a trajectory which uh, sort of ends in the deleted point. And then of course, when it uh, reaches the deleted point, my <coughs> receiver loses all the information about the traveling particle because it disappears from your realm. So does this happen in real life? Well, both yes and no. What does happen certainly is that uh, the traveling particle may go out of my observable reality and cross the reverse light cone of the receiver. This is fine, but as you realize, uh, this is a light ray. Right? And at the moment when my particle leaves the observable reality of the receiver, 
it means that they will see the moment when it disappears because this blue uh, curve is the light ray uh, moving at the speed of light. So there is a light trajectory connecting this point and they would be able to see it. So these things happen. In the example where I deleted a point, another thing happens because my particle disappears and I don't see it disappearing, it just disappears. <clears throat> so naked singularities we never observed yet. So hopefully never will. So uh, these are the two assumptions that I would like to make. No naked singularities and no time travel. So do not seem to uh, exist in our universe. So at least it is not an unreasonable assumption to prohibit time travel and to prohibit naked singularities. <clears throat> um, now, Vladimir, can you yes. finish this point? So, so there's quite a good logical argumentation towards uh, the uh, closed closure uh, uh, curves. But uh, what kind of, for example, thought experiment we can have in order to, to say that, well, there should be no naked singularities? Because the particle will disappear from your real. You, you just ask yourself that something happens and then you stop observing it. Have you ever seen such a thing in real life? The answer is no, such experiments do not yet exist. So oh, but I mean, they do it, not it, exist in principle. Yeah, but the problem is, of course, that, that we usually see quantum picture, right? And then, of course, the particle will go around. Uh, so, so like when, when we would like to make an actual experiment or, it, or, or maybe thought experiment, what? <laughs> Well, I, I have to explain the following strange thing uh, that uh, both one and two are violated inside of black holes. Mm -hmm. right? So it is uh, possible to make an experiment where you will see both one and two violated. You, you just have to go into the side of the black holes. Um, but the, the, the problem is that if you go inside of the black hole, you cannot get out. That's the whole idea of the black hole. So you, you will be able to observe it happening, but you would not be able to tell me how it looks like. <laughs> so uh, there is what is called a strong cosmic censorship conjecture of Penrose. which has many versions. I'm quoting just one of them, strong cosmic censorship. And what it says is the following, that if you delete black holes along the so-called horizons, one event horizons, then what is left is globally hyperbolic. Satisfies conditions one and two. Uh, so Penrose really says more. He says that any reasonable universe, not necessarily the universe we live in, but any reasonable universe, if you delete the black holes, will satisfy conditions one and two. So one and two uh, deserve special attention. They're called globally hyperbolic space times. So space times satisfying 
one and two are called globally hyperbolic. So here, the word globally hyperbolic is a little bit confusing because when usually people hear, hear the word hyperbolic, they assume something about metric of constant negative sectional curvature or something like that. This is not what is meant. Global hyperbolicity just means these two conditions, um, no closed causal curves and no naked singularities. And I have no idea why this uh, thin appears and disappears, but I don't know how to get rid of it. So I hope it will be the last thing for the talk. Uh, so, so let me go back in time, right? Because I'm trying to prohibit time travel. But when you give a talk, going to time travel is very easy. You just rotate the slide a little bit up and here you have your time travel. Uh, so there is a natural question that many people would ask probably subconsciously. So I deleted this point. Does it mean that your space time is incomplete? And then the answer is strange because um, uh, in relativity, you usually, when you study causality at least, uh, up to, you consider space times up to conform all factors. So space times up to a conformal factor can be made causally complete. So th this means the following, that uh, the picture that I draw would be a little bit misleading because in the picture, it seems that I can uh, reach the deleted point at a finite time, right? Because this is the trajectory which reaches the deleted point and uh, certainly the time parameter which is intrinsic to the curve seems to be finite but they can make the picture uh, geodesically complete in the time-like and null directions. And then it will take me infinite amount of time to get to this point. Geometrically, what it means is that I pinch uh, my space time at this point and I drag it to infinity. <clears throat> so then of course it will take me infinite amount of time to get there. And uh, the problem with the incompleteness disappears and I would uh, probably caution you a little bit. I'm not saying that it can be made always complete. I'm saying that it can be made complete in the causal geodesic directions. Ca causal means time-like and now. So moving at the speed less than the speed of light. So why is this important? Uh, because the causal trajectories, when you do a conformal change of the metric, do not change. They stay causal. And similarly, of course, the space-like trajectory stays space-like. Uh, so it is not quite true that uh, all space-times are complete, but if you care only about causality, then you can make them complete by a conformal change of the metric. Another place where I would like to caution you a little bit is that condition number one, which is absence of time travel, usually is phrased by saying that the space-time is causal. So I don't know if there are uh, any space, uh, any physicists in the audience, uh, but uh, many of you may have read the book by Hawking and Alice. And uh, in the book of Hawking and Alice, the definition of global hyperbolicity is a little bit different. 
in the book of Hawking and Dallas, uh, the definition of global hyperbolicity is that the space time is required to be strongly causal, whatever it is. So in addition to prohibiting time travel, you have to prohibit a little bit more. You still prohibit naked singularities. But what I'm saying is that there is uh, two wonderful French uh, Spanish mathematicians, uh, Antonio Bernal and Miguel Sanchez, uh, whose names we will meet many, many times in this talk. And basically what they proved uh, is, that, of course, they didn't prove that causality is the same as strong causality, because these are really different things. But what they proved is that in the presence of condition two, that there are no naked singularities, causality would imply strong causality. So I sort of cheat my way out of the situation. I do not need to explain what a strong causality because the definition that I give, which is no time travel, no naked singularities, is equivalent uh, to the definition in the Hawking and Dallas book, but due to non trivial reasons, which are the results of Bernal and Sanchez. Now, there is a classical theorem of Giroch. that says that every globally hyperbolic space time is equivalent to sigma cross R. So it has a rather strange topology. Right, so topologically, it always looks as a product of some manifold in the real line. So in particular, what you see is that the torus is not globally hyperbolic because it is not a product of anything in the real line. So all globally hyperbolic manifolds look as a product. And uh, there is a question of course, since we are doing mathematics, the question is what do I really mean by equal? When I say that a globally hyperbolic space time is equal to sigma cross R, what do I mean? And there are two options. I could uh, say that it means homeomorphic. Or I could say C infinity, diffeomorphic. And we know that uh, in uh, smooth topology, there are exotic smooth structures. So there are plenty of manifolds which are homeomorphic to each other, but not diffeomorphic to each other, even though they are smooth and differentiable. So these are really very different notions. <clears throat> so Giroux theorem, which was proved in the 60s, is about homeomorphic. Of course, if you are doing physics, then you want to uh, solve some sort of uh, partial differential equation. So you probably want to have a statement that it is diffeomorphic. And there was lots of confusion because quite a few physicists were using Dirac theorem under the assumption that it says that it is diffeomorphic to sigma cross R, but Dirac theorem does not say it. So the diffeomorphic part of the statement was proved rather recently in about 2010 by Bernal and Sanchez, whose names I have mentioned before. They are exactly the same two Spanish scientists that discovered that in the definition of global hyperbolicity, you can get rid of, causal of strong causality and you can substitute it by a weaker requirement of causality. <clears throat> so it is true. Uh, that every global hyperbolic space time is diffeomorphic to sigma cross R. But it is a non trivial and rather recent theorem. There were multiple attempts to prove this theorem, which were all incorrect, as it is shown in the wonderful uh, expose by Bernal and Sanchez. Uh, some of the most notable are due to Seifert and Dickman. So the fact is correct. But it appeared in the mathematical realm uh, much later than it started to be used in physics. Uh, so how is this 
uh, related to anything. So one thing that I uh, can fork my travel right now is the following, that I would like to uh, discuss a little bit what is the space of all light rays. So of course you probably know Riemann geometry pretty well. So you know that every Riemann manifold has geodesics. And of course the same is true for Lorentz manifolds. There are geodesics. This is the same equation that nabla gamma prime along gamma prime is zero. And the geodesics are split into three types. Space-like geodesics, which represent movement at the speed greater than the speed of light. Null geodesics, which represents movement at the speed of light. And time-like geodesics, which represent movement at the speed slower than light. So light rays are just null geodesics. So these are the trajectories of light rays in my universe. So one point of caution is that uh, when you talk about Riemann geometry, there is a, an idea of natural parameterization of the geodesic. So the natural parameterization of the geodesic is when you go with speed one. But if you talk about the null geodesic, then the dot product of the uh, velocity vector with itself is zero. So regardless of how you reparameterize it, you will never get one. So there is no uh, preferred parameterization of the null geodesic. There are many ones and they're related by the so-called affine reparameterization. The T goes to AT plus B. So these are constants. And the process is called the fine reparameterization. So of course you can ask what will happen if instead of choosing T goes to AT plus B, you choose a more complicated reparameterization and then says this would be a wonderful curve, but it will not satisfy the geodesic equation. But if you do the reparameterization T goes to AT plus B, it will be still a light ray. There is a question, what is the physical significance of this uh, number A? And uh, the answer is pretty much that this is the energy of a photon. <coughs> so photons go along light rays, but they have different energy and uh, these parameterizations correspond to different energies. So Bernal Sanchez actually proved much more. Bernal and Sanchez proved that uh, each sigma cross t can be assumed to be a Riemann. So what does it mean? So I mean that I have the Lorentz manifold. And in general, if I restrict the Lorentz metric to a submanifold, it is impossible to predict what kind of metric will I get. Maybe degenerate, it may be null, it may be Riemann as in this case. Bernal and Sanchez proved that you can uh, require that the restriction to each sigma cross t is Riemann. So the restriction of the Lorentz metric to sigma cross t is Riemann. The sigma has a name. So sigma is the so-called Cauchy surface. So what does it mean a Cauchy surface? So first of all, by the Jarosz theorem, my global hyperbolic space times are all of the form something cross R. So let me draw a torus here so that you don't think that it is a disk. Uh, so what does it mean that it is a Cauchy surface? It means that they do not have returns to the same set. So this black trajectory is not a time trap because it does not close up. 
but you start from a point of the surface and you return back to another point of the same surface. So if this happens, then the surface is not Cauchy. So in this case, it uh, is not, of course, a reasonable trajectory because the requirement is that causal curves do not return back to Cauchy surfaces. And this is not a causal curve because it goes faster than light. So causal curves do not return to the Cauchy surface. Okay, I think that this is almost, ah, no, I need to say one more thing. I need to say what is, so assume that X is the space time. And to the space time, I would like to associate another space, which is the space of all light rays in X. So how does the space look like? So assume that I have my space time, which for a change will be black. This is a Cauchy surface. And this is a light ray. So light ray is moving at a speed equal to the speed of light. So it has to intersect the Cauchy surface at one point. The velocity vector at the intersection point is not tangential to the Cauchy surface, but you can project it orthogonally to the Cauchy surface. So this would be the projection of the velocity vector to the Cauchy surface. And what you get is a non-zero vector tangential to the Cauchy surface. How do you know that it is non-zero? Well, here you can make an easy thought experiment. Assume that it is zero. The null vector is orthogonal to itself because it is null. By definition, it means that the dot product of the vector is with itself is zero, but then it is also orthogonal to the whole Cauchy surface. So it is orthogonal to everything. But it means that the Lorentz metric is degenerate, but one of the conditions of the Lorentz metrics is that it is not degenerate, so I know that the projection is non-zero. So uh, what would you get if you choose a different parameterization of the same light geodesic? Well, if you choose a different affine parameterization, the velocity vector will scale and the projection vector will scale, but the direction will be unchanged. So what you will get is that the space of light rays is the same as the so-called spherical tangent bundle of a Cauchy surface. So what is a spherical tangent bundle? It's the same as the usual tangent bundle, but instead of each tangent plane, you uh, choose a unit sphere. Uh, so once again, the reason why it is the same as the spherical tangent bundle is that if you choose a different light parameterization, it will rescale the velocity vector, it will rescale the projection, but the direction of the projection is unchanged. And this is the only thing which matters when you talk about the spherical tangent bundle. And of course, um, Bernal and Sanchez proved that uh, sigma is Riemann. So it means that the tangent bundle can be identified with a cotangent bundle. The spherical tangent bundle can be identified with the spherical cotangent bundle. And uh, this guy has a natural contact structure. 
basically it is the Liouville form. But I don't want to discuss context structures yet. Uh, sorry, uh, the definition of an X doesn't make sense because uh, I'm sorry? Sigma, sigma is X or uh, Sigma is any Cauchy in X. So sorry. Sigma I, is any, any Riemann Cauchy in X. Any Riemann Cauchy in X. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that the NX doesn't depend on uh, Sigma. Yes, it doesn't. But there is a wonderful theorem of flow, which is one of the founders of uh, this field, <clears throat> uh, who proved that quantum structure on the X does not depend on Sigma. So quantum structure on the space to flight rays does not depend on sigma. So it's strange, right? Because uh, in the definition of the quantum structure, I said the following, that spherical tangent bundle is the same as spherical cotangent bundle. Spherical cotangent bundle has the natural quantum structure, but then of course there is a very natural objection. What if I perturb the Cauchy surface a little bit, I will get another Cauchy surface. And of course it seems that uh, the quantum structure I should get would be different, but you, you don't, you get the same quantum structure. So Robert Lowell uh, proved essentially, he, he's a student of Penrose, as you could have guessed, well, former student, he is pretty adult now, and uh, he's a wonderful uh, scientist. He, he proved that uh, the quantum structure does not depend on sigma. So in, in particular, if you choose sigma somewhere here or here, it doesn't matter. The quantum structure in the space of light rays is canonical. So now let us discuss about smooth structures. So science fiction. So assume that you launch an astronaut into space and the astronaut returns and says that your space time is contractible. There is a natural question. Does it mean that it is uh, the same as the Euclidean space? Uh, so assume that the space time was of dimension m plus one. Does it mean that X is homeomorphic or diffeomorphic uh, to Rm plus one. And the answer is a little bit surprising. Of course, if you're a topologist, you know it very well, but if you're not a topologist, then it is surprising. The answer is no. Because there are so-called fake Euclidean spaces which are contractible but not homeomorphic Rm plus one. Uh, so the, the, the classical example is the Whitehead manifold. Uh, sometimes they're distinguishable by fundamental group at infinity, but it is a separate subject and I do not want to get into it. The important part is that there are uncountably many of them. So your astronaut provided very valuable data, the same that 
there are, that your space time is contractible, uh, but you, you don't really know which space time you live in because there are uncountably many options. Now assume that your astronaut is now a differential topologist. Then you realize that there is a next question. Okay, assume that, you know, somehow by a miracle, him or her return back to the earth and say that, okay, it is homeomorphic to M plus one. Of course, since this astronaut is a differential topologist, they should have asked, is it diffeomorphic to M plus one? And the answer is also predictable uh, that there are uncountably many exotic smooth structures. So what does it mean? It means that your manifold could be smooth and it could be homeomorphic to RM plus one with a canonical smooth structure, but it is not diffeomorphic to RM plus one. So, so the first such examples were I believe invented by Donaldson. Um, so there, there are many. There, there is a wonderful uh, article by Gopf, which showed that there are uncountably many such examples. So your astronaut returns back and says that, uh, okay, it's contractible, but you, you have no idea what universe you live in, because you don't even know if it is uh, homeomorphic to RM plus one, even if somebody tells you it is homeomorphic to RM plus one, you don't know if it is diffeomorphic to RM plus one. So on one hand side, you know a lot, on the other side, you don't know much. So now assume that we send Roger Penrose to the orbit. And he says that, uh, assume that your space time is globally hyperbolic. So assume that you have this extra data saying that your space time is globally hyperbolic, so there is no time travel and there are no naked singularities. So then our result with Nimirovsky, my co-author, is that X is diffeomorphic to the Euclidean space. Right, so now you know everything as it seems, right? Because you started by saying that it is contractible and uh, you, you don't know much. You said that, okay, maybe you know that it is homeomorphic to Euclidean space, you still don't know much. But if you say that Penrose's conjecture about uh, strong cosmic censorship is actually correct, then the universe you live in is globally hyperbolic, then we were able to prove that your universe is diffeomorphic to RM plus one. Let me uh, make a bit of, ah, so I should probably provide references. So the main references here would be Macmillan work and the work of Macmillan and Zeeman. And, uh, then you use some engulfing arguments and you need to finish with a uh, work of Mancris. So basically uh, the technique goes as follows that uh, using point correct conjecture, so Macmillan work was done in the assumptions that the point correct conjecture is true. And now we know that it is true, right? So it's once again, an example of time travel uh, so proved by Perelman uh, based on Hamilton's work. Um, 
So we, we get that the space time is PL equivalent, piecewise linear equivalent uh, to the Euclidean space. And then you say that if it is piecewise linear equivalent to the Euclidean space, then by the result of Mantras, it is differentiably equivalent to the Euclidean space. And uh, this would pretty much finish the proof. But the, the, there is a lot of technicalities which I prefer to skip. So let me ask you a strange question. Okay, so you proved that your space time is Euclidean space. Does it mean that sigma is Euclidean space? And the answer is no. So pretty much the same argument uh, showing that the product would be Euclidean space shows that for sigma, you can choose uh, any contractible space. And this is not our result. This is Newman and Clark. And uh, of course, this raises a question that the techniques I, I used to, we, we used uh, to prove that X is diffeomorphic to n plus one are four dimensional because Macmillan's result is uh, for three and four dimensional manifolds. So the, the same is true in higher dimensions by the result of Stollings. And when I use the result of Stollings, once again, implicitly I'm using uh, the results of Bernal and Sanchez, uh, which are saying that uh, globally hyperbolic space times are diffeomorphic to sigma cross r. If I cannot use the results of Bernal and Sanchez, uh, this fact is wrong. So the uh, first uh, thing that you get from this is that there is some sort of a strange cosmic censorship of smooth structures. Right, because you started with uh, some assumptions on your universe, and then suddenly out of the blue, you realize that fake Euclidean spaces do not matter. Exotic Euclidean spaces do not matter. There is only one option, the canonical smooth structure of the Euclidean space. So basically uh, what happens is that this uh, cosmic censorship of Penrose behaves as some sort of a guide. It says that if you want to have a reasonable space time, all these exotic smooth structures are completely irrelevant. Okay, but you, you will say, of course, that th this is a very strong assumption because it started with an assumption that your space time is contractible. So by the Georges result, so now, now uh, I would like to look only at the four dimensional case. So by Georges result, if you have a space time which could have been globally hyperbolic, <coughs> Then it is homeomorphic to sigma cross R.
right? Because the Giroch result says that every global hyperbolic space time is homeomorphic to sigma cross R. So if I want to have even an option to have a reasonable space time, I don't really care about all other space times. I care only about sigma cross R. So assume that I would like to impose one more restriction. Assume that sigma is orientable and a closed manifold. Then you get a surprising fact. Once again, it is our result with Stefan Nimirovsky. that says that your global hyperbolic space-time is diffeomorphic to sigma cross R. So once again, on the first glance, there was ambiguity of smooth structures. You said that your space-time is homeomorphic to sigma cross R. There are many smooth structures you could have chosen, uh, but I'm saying that as soon as it is globally hyperbolic, Uh, it would imply that the space time is diffeomorphic to sigma cross R. And uh, here, what I'm using is that th sigma is three dimensional. So the exotic smooth structures, they start from dimension four. So there is a unique smooth structure in sigma. So there is a unique natural smooth structure in the product. And this is the smooth structure I'm talking about. So there is a natural question. How important are these assumptions that sigma is orientable in the closed manifold? And then says we don't know. So in higher dimensions, this is false. But for sigma three-dimensional non-compact and non-orientable, the question is open. So it could be that the same uh, cosmic censorship of Penrose prohibits uh, smooth structures, exotic smooth structures, uh, non-compact or non-orientable. Question is open. Vladimir, you have tiny yes. meat mouth. I'm sorry? Tiny meat mouth. Tiny meat. Yeah, yeah. I will try to finish in five minutes. Uh, so uh, uh, now, if you want to generalize this result to high dimensional space times, So M greater than three uh, might be done along the following idea. <clears throat> so we would not want to say that uh, the space-time detect, detects the smooth structure. Uh, we will instead say that probably uh, the space of light rays detects the smooth structure. Right, so conjecturally, 
uh, if you fix the space time and you say that you are given a contact manifold of all light rays, uh, then you would know the smooth structure in your space time. And the references which I forgot to mention is, of course, geometrization proved by Perelman and uh, the work of Turaev uh, saying that topological age cabardism is the same as homeomorphism in this particular dimension. So I have two minutes, right? What? You can uh, spend five minutes more because uh, we close at one o'clock, but uh, you want to have the discussion if somebody has some questions. Yeah. So if you have my two minutes, okay, five minutes, answer, okay. okay. Let, let me quickly say what is a black hole. Roughly speaking, a black hole looks as some sort of a surface and the uh, light cones, they're tangential to the surface. So this looks like a cylinder. So this is black hole. And uh, since you cannot move outside of the cylinders, what will happen is that your particle can get inside of the black hole, but it cannot get out. Now this uh, surface, which we will repaint green, is the so-called event horizon. So it is the so-called singular null hypersurface, but what it means in terms of contact geometry is that it defines a contact manifold. I'm sorry, my quantum Legendre manifold in the contact manifold of all light rays. So the previous talk that I gave in Prague virtually this season was at the Charles University where I explained that Legendre and Lincoln completely determines causality in space time. So this is if one event could influence the other event. And I am we are, we are proposing, uh, roughly speaking, the following idea, that the event horizon is a Legendre manifold. Uh, so you take this Legendre manifold and you choose another Legendre manifold, which is the event horizon intersected with the Cauchy surface. And then for the third uh, link component, you choose a small sphere located inside of the black hole. <coughs> so this is back in progress with Stefan Nimirovsky. And uh, roughly speaking, what we hope, as opposed to what we can, is to show that different types of black holes give different types of Legendre linkages. The reason why we hope that this is the case is that they appear in Legendre and submanifolds are non-loose. And this is when you have interest in Legendre and Lincoln theory. And this is exactly the reason why causality was determined by Legendre and Lincoln. And this is the place where I would like to finish the today's talk. So thank you for your attention. Yes, Do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, let us thank the speaker. So, Roman, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Uh, uh, so maybe you will take the chat. Uh, Ask some questions. There is a message in the chat that you read. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Yeah, thank you. Can I ask you? Sure. Uh, so uh, when, when, when you say, say about this uh, and linking for black holes, uh, so do you use only like Laurentian structure or you actually uh, impose some sort of Einstein condition? I impose what kind of conditions? Einstein condition on the metric. No, the, I, I do not impose any Einstein conditions on the metric. And uh, I, I should probably add the following phrase that when I'm saying that globally hyperbolic space times look as sigma cross r differentiably, I definitely do not mean that they look as a product in the metric sense. Yeah. Right? So uh, it, the expanding universes, contracting universes, 
universes that expand in some directions, contract in some directions, they all fail. It is a topological restriction. And I do not need the Einstein metric condition. Vladimir, could you please say uh, why uh, why Legendrians that you consider why why are uh, non loose? They're, they're non loose because of the following: that there is a <coughs> paper of Leon, which says that if you have a loose Legendrian submanifold, then you have a, a positive Legendrian isotopia uh, of the submanifold back, back to itself. So positive Legendrian isotopy means that it is an isotopy in the class of Legendrian submanifolds. But if you compute uh, the uh, contact form on the uh, velocity vector of the moving particles during the isotopy, the result is positive. And there is a result of uh, ours with uh, Stefan, a different result, uh, that says that uh, conormal bundles of a submanifold. So I do not want to say that it is one dimensional, two dimensional, just of three uh, dimension K. Do not have such loops. Can one, can one also say that, let's say, conormal lifts are in general fillable, hence they are not loops, or it's not really important, oh, I, I mean, uh, as a reason. I don't think that this would. No, no. I mean, loose and fillable are opposite things, but uh, I'm not sure whether. Anyway, so I, I need to think. Sorry. <laughs> no. So we, we basically, it is a combination of two results. Of the result of Leo, which says that if you have a loose Legendre and some manifold, then you should have a positive Legendre and isotopy back to itself. And of our result saying that. Uh, if you look at the spherical tangent bundle of basically a Cauchy surface, which is the same, of course, as the space of light rays, uh, and you look at a conormal bundle of any submanifold, so say in this case a circle, a conormal bundle will look as a torus, uh, then there are no positive Legendre in the top is back to itself. So to the, this combined knowledge says that they're non loose Non-loose Legendre and submanifolds are exactly the submanifolds where you expect to have interesting Legendre and link theory. And uh, we try to piggyback on the same trick. We are saying that the fact, uh, we, we didn't know at that time, of course, that uh, they're non-loose, but essentially the reason why Legendre and link completely determines causality is exactly that they're non-loose. It can be reformulated this way. And we are, we are hoping that the same trick would provide some essential information about black holes. But Maybe we don't know which question. information, right? I don't want to say that uh, we have a, a clear idea as to what exactly we expect. So we probably expect that different types of uh, black holes like Schwarzschild and Kerr would give different things. So the intriguing part is that now you would be able to talk about black holes in the absence of space-time, because if you reformulate what is a black hole in terms of Legendre and Lincoln, you don't need the space-time. You just have a contact manifold, you have some Legendre and Lincoln, you can call it a black hole. But from your space-time, you, you, you actually using only conformal structure, right? Yeah, I use only the conformal structures. Yep. Oh, if there are no more questions, let us thank the speaker again. So thank you for the very pleasant questions and for the pleasant audience. And I hope as probably will do that, the pandemic will stop in some finite time and that would be, and we will all be able to travel, which in my case would imply that I would come to Prague in person.